Well, one thing we've established is that I'm the old guy in the room, right? So let me be that. The title for this session uh, comes from an interview that was conducted with Paul Barger, the owner of a small business company called Pal's Sudden Service, located in East Tennessee. Uh, Pal Sudden Service won the Baldrige National Quality Award for Small Business in 2001. And so they came in to interview him about uh, what was happening with the business. Part of that interview, the, the interviewer reminded uh, Pal Barger that the industry has a 130% turnover rate, fast food industry. But then he asked him, with that kind of a turnover rate that goes on in your industry, why would you spend so much money like you do on training new hires when they might be leaving shortly after you train them? And Pal simply looked at the interview and said, what if they stay? Now, I love that quote. I think it speaks volumes about the commitment to a culture of high performance and investing in employees. And that's what we want to spend some time talking about here now for the next, this session. So what we need to be focusing on, I think, is a workforce a learning and development that is a comprehensive and integrated system. Okay? It has to flow out of the culture of performance excellence. Uh, we need to be committed to that if we're ever going to be able to do HR effectively and, and our training effectively. So if we look at this, uh, it helps shape that culture of performance excellence. It uh, contributes to workforce engagement and high performance. It supports personal development and it supports the organization's needs. Now, if we achieve those kind of things, we need to kind of look at what is this culture of high performance that we're talking about. There's lots of different models. The one that I uh, really like is the Baldridge model, which uh, relates to what Pal said in service and why and I ever saw that interview. The Baldridge model of performance excellence uh, if, if you don't have a model, you, you ought to look at this one. There's other models such as Lean Enterprise and those kind of things. And some of you, there's some organizations in, in the area that are doing tremendous things with these. But if you don't have a model, you really ought to look at finding one that works. Now, the, I'm going to give you a simple explanation of, of the Baldridge model. I'm going to do it around this framework of a bicycle because we all understand how a bicycle works. So on the front wheel of this bicycle, we put what we call the leadership triad in this model. And it's leadership, strategy, and customers. And this, this is the front wheel of the bicycle, which sets the direction that the organization will go. Now, on the back wheel, we put what we call the results triad. And this consists of workforce, operations, and results. Now, this is the, the part that drives the bicycle. This is what makes the organization go. And then we have the measurement, analysis, and knowledge management piece of this model. Uh, which provides a very fact-based, knowledge-driven system for improving performance and competitiveness. Now, if you think of it in the bicycle model here, this is how it's reading what the road that we're on. What's the terrain look like? How are we assessing that in the process of, of deciding how and where this bicycle is going to go? Now, key element that ties all this together then is the organizational mission, vision, and core values. You've got to have this constant feedback between the leadership triad and the results triad 
And the measurement analysis pieces and bringing all this together into an integrated system and model that, that uh, focuses on performance excellence. Now, it's always fancy to talk about a model like this, but uh, let me suggest to you that it's not always easy to embrace a model like this. Uh, however, the Baldridge organization and, uh, and uh, in, in the Missouri and Kansas uh, area, we have the Midwest uh, Excellence Institute, which are there to help organizations move into these models and to walk you through how to get there. You've got to have a clear plan. And the other thing I want to mention about this model, it's non-prescriptive. It doesn't tell you exactly how you have to do any of these elements. It just gives you a way to assess and make sure that you have processes and measurements and, and all the elements in place to sustain this kind of uh, a model of performance excellence. Now, out of the model, flows uh, a mission-driven uh, perspective. So we maintain this focus on our mission and an understanding that when you change one part of the model or the organization or anything in an organization, it affects the other parts. A lot of times in organizations, especially when we're talking about culture, we forget about the fact that that's happening. The other, another element here is extraordinary emphasis on external and internal customers. But this, this performance model uh, has that. Uh, any of you ever go to Chick-fil-A to eat? Okay, nobody does? Okay, we do. Chick-fil-A just moved from number seven to number three in the, in the nation in, in revenues, okay? Their, they, uh, their revenue per store, though, uh, is twice the amount of Starbucks and McDonald's who are still ahead of them in total revenues. Uh, and they do that without being open on Sunday. Now, why, how do they do it? How does Chick-fil-A, how have they moved this way? Why are they so, so successful? Now, if you've been there, you know they've got a decent product, but so do the other businesses. What it is that causes Chick-fil-A to be so successful is this extraordinary level of customer service that they have through extraordinary employees that provide it. Uh, and a huge amount of training that goes into that whole process to do that. Uh, they have a tremendous model of, of performance excellence that shapes their culture, that defines what they do, how they do it, driven with a mission that uh, accomplishes all this. And uh, it, it's a great example for us to look at uh, that kind of success. Uh, another thing that flows out of this performance excellence model is a a culture of continuous improvement. Now, we hear that a lot. Uh, I just want to put some emphasis here on the word empowerment that goes with that. You can't have continuous improvement without empowerment of people. Now, I don't think any of you have a job now that fits into this category, but probably somewhere in your past, let me know if you've had a job where things weren't going quite like they needed to be. The outcomes weren't consistently what they needed to be. You and the other workers who were doing this job knew how to fix it, but you couldn't get management to listen. You ever had a job like that? Yeah, so I think a lot of us have, have been there. Uh, my youngest son, when he was 16 years old, got a job at a hospital and he was working with one of his buddies and their job, they had a connecting uh, adjacent through a, a, a walkway kind of thing, a nursing facility, and their job was to, they worked in the dietary department, and their job was to transport the food that was prepared 
from the hospital over to the nursing facility so it could be served. And they had a cart and some things that they did as they were taught and trained exactly how this should be done, when it should be done, etc. How about two months into the job, uh, he and his buddy figured out a better way. 16 years old, but they did. They, they sat down, they figured out a better way, and they got all excited about it, and, and uh, they went to their manager and told the manager, look, we've come up with a better way to do this. It'll be more efficient, more effective. And the manager, very nice lady, cared about them, but she looked at them and she said, that's not your job. You're just supposed to do what we tell you to do, and, and just don't, you don't need to think about making things better. He came home that evening, and I can still remember, I was sitting in the living room, and he came in, and he sat down and told me this, and here's what he said. He said, Dad, I will never offer another idea of how to make things better. And it struck me how when we don't empower people to speak up, to, and, and all the studies I've done in quality management tell us this, that it's management who keeps deciding how systems ought to work, and management isn't the one doing the work. And they always, when systems are going wrong, it, it's because management doesn't get it. The workers do. And if you're not empowering workers in your organization, and we can talk about training and all these other things, but if there's no empowerment there, uh, the rest of it doesn't work very well. And so you got to find ways to do that. Now, I'm going to give you a quick definition of empowerment just to, just to define this, because a lot of people use this word and they say, well, we empower employees. Well, if employee doesn't know exactly what's expected of them, and uh, we heard some of that in the previous session, uh, if they, if they don't have measurements to tell them how they're doing, if they don't have a means to collectively work together to figure out how to do it better, uh, and if they don't have a support system that uh, allows them to make mistakes in that process, you don't have empowerment. And without empowerment, anything that's going wrong is still management's problem. Another piece here that fits into that and ties in very closely with that is this idea of valuing people. Uh, you have to value people uh, in, in this, uh, this whole process, not just as uh, workers, but as people. Now, I'm, I'm going to give you some little insights about me. I started out in the world of accounting. Okay? That was my degree. Uh, I became the corporate controller of a company that owned and operated nursing facilities. It was a nonprofit organization. And I'm a little embarrassed to tell you this, but I, I, I kind of looked at things from the cost perspective. Any, any of you know people in your organization that keep looking at things from the cost perspective? Yeah. And uh, I thought, hey, if, uh, if people leave and... Uh, we hire new people, that's good, because the new people come in at lower wage. If they stay, we have to keep paying them more. Terrible perspective. I'm embarrassed to tell you that I actually thought that way early in my career for a little while. <laughs> and and it's, it's not the perspective that we need. One of the things that helped me transition this and even uh, thinking was we had a, a lady that worked in our office her name was Amy. She had uh, left the workforce for a while, had been raising her family, and decided to come back into the workforce. We ended up hiring her as a secretary and receptionist. And there were certain duties she had to do that related to getting mail out and, and handling all that correctly. And she kept making mistakes. Now, she made some mistakes that cost us a lot of money. There were some things that needed to be mailed to a certain place at a certain time related to uh, uh, regulatory things. And if we didn't get it there, our income didn't go up as quickly as it should have and some things like that. And it, it, it 
It was the second time it happened. It cost us $5,000, and I was upset because of her performance, and there were other things. And so I went to her direct boss and said, you need to fire Amy. Uh, he he was, was a good guy. He called her in. He said, Bernie thinks I need to fire you. Um, I was back at the copy machine making copies. She came back and said, I understand. You think I ought to be fired. This is a fun conversation, right? Uh, I had an intern working for me that summer uh, in accounting, uh, six foot nine guy. And I called him in my office. I said, I, I want you to learn. You're an intern. So let me tell you what's happened here. And I told him about the performance problem and how I thought she ought to be fired and, and what's happened. And I said, what do you think? And he looked at me and said, I don't think you handled that very well. And, and it's, it really, well, you know, you, have, you all have those aha moments where you think, wait a minute. And I, it struck me. And even uh, I'm, I'm, I have a strong faith base, and, and I, I realized I didn't treat her like a person. I, I, I valued her only because she could, if she could do the job right. And it doesn't give you an excuse not to hold people accountable for the work that they do, but you've got to back up and make sure that you're still respecting the person as a person. And so I went to Amy and I apologized. I uh, sat down with her and I said, I, I've done poorly with this. I'm sorry. Uh, I, please forgive me. I do value you as a person. I think maybe you're in the wrong job, that the work that you have to do doesn't fit your strengths. But, you know, that's another issue. I want you to know I value you as a person. She looked at me and said, I don't believe you. So I worked hard at trying to show her that respect that we were talking about in the previous session. Um, it was, uh, she ended up leaving, getting another job somewhere else. Um, and then, I don't know, about three months later, she and her husband showed up at a Sunday school class that I taught. And about a month after that, her husband came to me and said, I need to talk to you after class. I said, okay. So after class, everybody left, and he came to me, and he says, I'm in financial trouble. This was up in Omaha, Nebraska. I, I, he said, I need to go to Texas for a while to work with my, my family to get some money put together, leaving Amy and the kids behind. He says, I want you to follow up with Amy. I need you to be checking on her. He said, there isn't anybody in this city that she respects more than you. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Now, that gets back to this issue of valuing people. We, we've got to value people for who they are. And when we do that, it gives us a lot of leverage to deal with people on the accountability side as well. And finally here, I want to mention that uh, performance excellence focus, when we really do this, uh, we need to confront the brutal facts. Uh, this idea that we have a tendency in our organizations to cover up things that aren't going well, to blame them on something that we have no control over, uh, and in the process of doing that, ignore the fact that we need to fix them uh, is too prevalent in, in our American society for some reason. And so I... I encourage you in your organizations, when you see things that maybe aren't going so well, try to figure out how to be able to confront that. They say, well, our leaders don't do that. Hey, don't start with the leaders. Start with where you are, okay? Deal with the work unit you're in. If it's HR staff, then deal with it there. Uh, deal with it where you are, and that's where you have control but don't be afraid to confront the brutal facts. And if you don't, uh, it, it just doesn't get there. I put together a seminar at the organization up in Omaha 
uh, where we brought in uh, five companies that, that we wanted to benchmark their best personnel practices. Three of those companies were Baldridge Quality Award winners, FedEx, uh, Wainwright Industries, and uh, Ritz-Carlton Hotel. Representatives came and shared about their, their best practices. Every one of them got up at the, at the beginning of their share of the presentation. The first thing they talked about were the things that they weren't doing as well as they wanted to do. That's the first thing they talked about. Uh, they wanted us to know they were not a perfect organization just because they'd won the award. Here's some things that we're not doing as well that we're working on. Uh, it's difficult to develop this learning and development, uh, development system in your organization. It's difficult to have it thrive if you're not willing to confront the brutal facts and move ahead. Let me take a look here at uh, another perspective as we move into starting to look at some of the thing, key elements of, of the uh, training and development system that we ought to be probably focusing on. But let's take a look at some environmental changes that are happening in our world today. And, and uh, these are the kind of things, every organization is different. You all have different issues that you deal with, but we're all probably dealing with uh, some of these things. Our issue is, is that these things are kind of evolving and they hit us down the road and we need to be planning for them now, but if we're not, uh, we, we all, you guys get busy and, and you get to focus on the immediate issues and uh, you're always kind of wrestling with that and there isn't time to look ahead. Well, th these are things that maybe we need to be looking ahead at. Uh, the labor curve inverted last year. That means that uh, we started having fewer workers in the workforce uh, than we had the year before. Uh, wow, huh? So anybody having trouble hiring people? <laughs> guess, guess why? Yeah. Uh, we, we've got uh, that has a reality. Now, without immigrants, uh, 18 million fewer workers uh, will, will, we will have 18 million fewer workers in 2035. Uh, we've all got this immigrant issue, everybody's talking about it, but this is just laying out the facts. Uh, uh, we are seven years into an 18-year wave of baby boomers reaching 65. Uh, if you think about people retiring at 65, uh, this means you're losing people rather rapidly uh, to this way, okay? Uh, millennials and Gen Xers each are 34% of the workforce. The millennials group is still growing. The Gen Xers is now declining. Uh, and by 2024, 25% of the workforce will be 55 years old or older. Now, we can look at this into uh, a graphic sense just to try to give you some perspective of where these lines go, um, and it, it just kind of helps you get, get the picture of some of these statements I'm making. So uh, part of this environmental reality also includes that studies show that baby boomers uh, stay when they feel valued, and 85% of baby boomers in a research study said they might be willing to work in their 70s or even 80s. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, it's, I don't know where they come up with the dates for these groups, but I'm actually one year earlier than a baby boomer. That's kind of scary, isn't it? But I love working. I do. I, I tried staying home, retired for six months, and I got tired of watching those... Uh, Hallmark movies with my wife. I just, it just, just wasn't working for me. And uh, so when I got recruited by this company, I actually started setting up this idea that I will offer training programs for companies that need uh, internal training. Uh, and I still have, I've set that process up, but then I got recruited by Pure and Clean to come in and help them set up their structure and systems to support the growth they're having. 
and and I'm loving it. So so don't ignore us, old people. Uh, find a way to maybe look at embracing us and keeping us in the organizations that you have. Uh, only one third of HR professionals recognize uh, that the loss of talent due to retirement is a problem. That was an SHRM study. Uh, the difference between generations can be exaggerated. You hear a lot of talk about, well, millennials, we've got to treat them differently than we do the Gen Xers and the baby boomers, and there's this conflict that goes on and all these values. The truth of it is, yeah, they, they think a little differently. These groups all have some different things that are more important to them than other things. But all of them care about being valued. They care about being recognized. They care about being uh, empowered. And if you're doing those things, uh, you can overcome a lot of those things that people are saying you need to worry about. Um, so immediate demands often keep organizations from developing strategies for these long-term trends. And uh, I'm just encouraging you, to, as you're looking at developing HR systems and the learning and, and development systems for your people, you've got to keep these things in mind as well. So now let me shift over with that background in being committed to performance excellence with looking at some of the trends that are going to be impacting how you think and what you do. Let's look at some key learning uh, system elements here. Um, during my career, I've had the privilege of participating in and, and leading and providing consultation for culture change in organizations that range from five to 2,400 people. Uh, I've I've seen some things that don't work. I've seen some things that do work. Uh, I, I want to kind of focus on a few things that I think are really important in this limited time that we have uh, that I, I have seen work that I would encourage you to, to maybe uh, take a look at, making sure that you're embracing as part of what you do. One of those is to make sure that you're developing and analyzing outcomes. Uh, that relate to both your HR side and the learning and development side. Uh, so measure turnover. At least measure your annual turnover rate. It's very easy to do. You take the number of terminations that you've had during the year and divide it by the average number of positions available. That's your turnover rate. Say, well, do I exclude this group and that group? You know, uh, no, you don't exclude any groups. You just take your total because they're, they're, it's all turnover. <laughs> uh, you can analyze why that happened by looking at different groups, but when you compute your turnover rate, look at it and get it to where you've defined it. This is what we do, and you compare it from year to year, or you can break it down and compare it from quarter to quarter. Uh, or semi-annually, uh, all you have to do is take that number of terminations in the quarter and annualize the number by multiplying it by four, and you'll get your annual rate of turnover uh, out of it, but you can do that on a quarterly basis. So at least measure the overall turnover rate. Another measure of turnover that I like to use is a retention rate, okay? Uh, this is the number of workers who've been with you for one year or more divided by the average number of positions available, okay? So these are the, this ignores people that terminate with less than a year. You're focusing on what percentage of my workforce uh, is my, is, am I retaining? Uh, it's, it's a good measure to, to be looking at. Another one that I like to use, and you may not, if you've got low turnover, you, you may not even want to look at this one, but the organization I was in up in Omaha, when I went there, uh, we had an 85% turnover rate. A lot of nurse aides, uh, a lot of housekeeping, dietary people, uh, people like that. We had, we had a lot of turnover, and we weren't measuring this stuff. And, uh, 
uh, when we got in and looked at it, one of the things we said, well, let's, let's look at churn rate. Churn rate is the number of terminations that we had of people that worked less than six months divided by the average number of positions. So this gives you a very specific measure over time of how many people are, staying, are, are we hiring that are only staying with us a short period of time. Um, when we started measuring the churn rate, we looked at one of our facilities, and, and again, I'm embarrassed to share some of these stories because you'd say we would never do that, but yeah, whatever. Bear with my embarrassment. So we looked at one of our facilities, and they had a really high, it was a little facility in a rural area in, in Iowa, had a really high churn rate, uh, number of terminations less than six months. And so we went in to explore what was going on why this was. What we discovered <laughs> is when they hired somebody new, they put them in a room for their first two days watching videos, training videos. Not hardly any interaction with anybody. Two days stuck in a room watching videos. And they were leaving. <laughs> Sometimes they didn't tell them we were leaving. They just didn't come back the next day <laughs> to watch the videos. So they had, their, and, and you know, a, a poor orientation system, onboarding system uh, can create a high turnover rate, uh, or churn rate. So uh, uh, that's, that's where it became valuable to us. Now the point with these measures is that you don't just measure and stick them on the wall or in your dashboard or whatever you do with your measures. You gotta analyze them. You gotta figure out why these numbers are changing or why they are where they are. Uh, so this requires you to find the root cause of this stuff. Now, simple definition of root cause, one, we call it peeling the onion, one layer at a time. You do that by asking why. And you ask why five times. So when you get the answer to the first why, you ask why again. And when you do that, you get down to usually the core cause of why this is happening. If you don't go that deep, you'll have some surface reason, and you go address that, you won't ever get the problem solved. So get down to the root cause of the problem. Now, another measure that I think is essential is to compute the cost of turnover. Uh, This is a, a process of you having to calculate, and you, everybody does it a little differently, but uh, calculating uh, when, when we have a turnover, when we have somebody terminate, what's it costing us to replace them? So you've got your recruiting costs in there, you've got your training and development costs at time, you've got the lost time element that somebody else is having to pick up They've got a lot of different things there that you can put into that number. And probably once you get to the number you have, you, you have of those real costs, we call them, you ought to at least multiply it by one and a half times because there's, there's a, a loss of, of uh, a, a lots of unknown kind of things that happens in there too. But at least get to your real numbers uh, and cost to turnover. Uh, document uh, that. Uh, adjustment annually, always report it to leadership. Leadership needs to know what the cost of turnover is. Again, in the organization in Omaha, when we went in and started looking at these kinds of numbers, it shocked us. And when we saw the cost of turnover, we could no longer ignore the fact that it, it turnover costs, you don't readily see them because they're just embedded in there. They're, they're not part of your accounting system, per se. And if you just ignore them, you don't ever see what a tremendous impact this has on your cost system. Now, what do leaders think about the most, senior leaders? What's their language? The dollars, the money. So this is a way to communicate an issue to them in a real way that draws their attention that we need to be investing in some changes that can make an impact here uh, by, by doing this. Uh, the national average uh, from a study uh, that I read 
for 2016 said that uh, it's 16 to 20 percent. The 16 percent number was on people under 30,000 a year uh, who tend to turn over more. The 20 percent was the 30 to 50,000. They said on senior leaders uh, making 100,000 or more that the, the turnover cost is 213 percent. So uh, whether those numbers are valid, I, there's a problem with averages for me. I, I, we like to use them. Uh, I learned uh, from one instructor one time that said, you can have your head in the oven and your feet in the freezer, and your average temperature may be okay, but you're in trouble. So, so averages are averages. Uh, keep in mind there's, there's uh, relevant ends of those averages that need to be paid attention to. Uh, we need to make sure that we're going to create a sustainable structure. Uh, to do this, we need to assess workforce needs by listening to the people. Uh, I don't know how you design your training programs. I know a lot of them from my experience and observation of a lot of different companies, a lot of them are things that you have to do. So training gets focused first on mandatory training, right? Uh, things that we have to train people about. Uh, some organizations don't move very on far beyond that. Some try to, but when they do, they're often saying, well, I saw this, and so it's senior leaders or Sometimes HR people saying, well, I saw this. I think we need to do a training program on this. All I'm encouraging you to do is go out there and ask your workers what they think they need to be taught. Uh, now, they may not know everything that they need to be taught, but they know what they do need to know. And uh, we did this in the organization up in Omaha again, and we did it as a research project. We just pulled a team together to work on this. We trained our team on how to do formal interviews. We went out into several of our organizations to all different types of workers, and we conducted uh, small group or individual interviews to ask them, what would you like to be learning? Both from a personal development side and from a work level side to do your work better. We collected all that interview information. We compiled it to see what was alike, what was different. Uh, we then took the lists of personal and the work-related ones, and we turned it into a survey, which we went out into nine of our facilities, and we did the survey with all employees in those nine facilities, and we asked them, Here's personal things that we heard you would like to learn. Simply, no, I'm not interested in this. Yes, I'm somewhat interested in this. Uh, yes, this really is something I want to learn. So we gave them three choices on all the, and it, that went into their individual work areas too. And so out of that survey, we could compile what, this is what our employees want to learn. The best way to train is to give people information and knowledge that they want to know. If you're trying to start out by forcing something on people that they don't want to know, it doesn't work very well. So at least start with an assessment by figuring out a way to listen to your employees about what they want to be trained on. Uh, and then be sure that you're able to design and select training programs that, that work. Uh, when you're doing this, make sure you consider time factor uh, and the methods of training that work. Uh, if you've got people that the best you can do to keep operations going, whatever it is, the best you can do is get them off of the line or off of the, off the job for an hour or an hour and a half, uh, don't try to set up a train program that's going to be a half a day long. Uh, it messes up. You remember that thing early I said, well, when you do one part, it always affects another part? So make sure that you're, you're 
And plus, some people just they, they just can't handle two hours or three hours. Uh, you're probably wondering why I've been here as long as I have now, right? Some of you. So, uh, so make sure you're paying attention to time. The other piece of that is the method. Uh, there's a tendency to do a lot of online stuff, uh, webinar, uh, and that may be fine if it works for the type of employees that you're training. If, it, if it's not something they're receptive to, I've, I've had to do online training where I've had to go out and watch a sexual harassment training video and then I have to answer a bunch of questions and I, I don't like that kind of training. So, but that's me. And so you got to find something that works. And look at methods that work and pay attention to those. Uh, then consistently deliver programs. Uh, I remember we got all excited about training uh, supervisor. We put together a supervisor training program, and I'll share some of that with you in a little bit. And we went out and launched it for all of our supervisors. Uh, we did it in multiple locations where we grouped supervisors from different facilities together. They came in for the training. And uh, we launched that. We took us six months to get everybody through it. We patted ourselves on the back and said, sigh of relief, said, well, we got that done. We're excited. And we went on another project. Guess what we realized six months later? We had some different supervisors out there who didn't have the training, right? So you got to have a way when you put a training program together that's something that's important to bring the new people in to get that training. It's got to be consistently delivered uh, over time. And then uh, you want to always measure the learning effectiveness. Uh, ask people how it went, what worked, what didn't work. I was a teacher at Evangel uh, University. Uh, I came in to teach my first classes. Uh, I found out teaching is a lot more work than I thought it was going to be. I thought I was semi-retiring when I left the corporate world to teach. Uh, and it, it was, I was a lot busier than I thought. But from the day one, I, every class I had, I put together a feedback team. Uh, I, I picked, I, I had a process where they put their names on a slip of paper if they wanted to be on the feedback team. And then we multi drew five names. And that was my feedback team for the class. I can tell you that first semester that I taught, I brought the feedback team in after, after one month and said, all right, I, I don't think things are going as well as I'd like them to. Help me to understand how to make this class better. What am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? I've done that. I did that for all the, the years that I taught in every class, always had a feedback team. I got good enough that I didn't have to do it early on, I did it at the end of every semester. But they always told me, and, and the learners, people who are learning liked to tell you how they learn and what works. And uh, so always assess every session that you have uh, to make sure that it's, it's working for the people that you're doing it for. Another methodology here to get into effective training uh, and what's working is to uh, benchmark the best practices of other organizations. Now, I've listed up here a series of steps that uh, you do when you do benchmarking. How many of you have ever gone out and formally benchmarked another organization's, any aspect of their HR practice you have? A few, a few of you have. A uh, very valuable process. Now, to do this, you've got to, first of all, make sure you've identified uh, an area that you want to see significant improvement in. Now, sometimes this area is working for you. It's okay. It's not a major problem, but you just see a need to get really better if you're going to move forward into this performance excellence arena, and you want to find a way to do that. And it's not embedded in your organization to figure that out. You're going to go find another organization that seems to be doing really well at this and, and benchmark what they do. Now, benchmarking to me is not benchmarking a number. It's benchmarking a process, okay? But you need to know the numbers that they're getting to know that they're doing an outstanding job. So find organizations that are doing an outstanding job in the area that you're looking at and then contact them and see if they'll let you come visit. 
It's that simple. Uh, you guys, Connell's creating a, a network here uh, that should give you opportunities to benchmark each other, but you're going to have to figure out and explore who that will work with. Uh, my experience is that when we did this and contacted companies, I was always wondering why in the world would they let us come do this, but they always did. I, I never had anybody turn me down. And then we got to the point where we were doing so well, we had companies coming and benchmarking us, and so we were hosting benchmarking events. It's, it's, a, it's a really great process. Uh, and uh, those steps there kind of tell you the, the, the way to do that. And this slide deck will be available to you, right, Heather? Yeah, so you can, you can look at those. Let me give you uh, an example. Uh, on our HR practices, we, we put together a team from people of our facilities and from our corporate office and learned about this pet food company. Iams Pet Food Company, located in South Dakota. Uh, and uh, the, the, they had these tremendous outcomes in several areas of HR that we wanted to, to look at. Uh, I found out about them through the, the quality organization that I was a part of, contacted them. They said, sure, we'll host you. Come up. So we brought a team up of nursing home people going to a pet food company to learn about HR. Huh? Strange. Um, but that's the way it works sometimes. The organization doesn't have to be in the same business you are to, to learn from them, uh, especially on a lot of these things. Now, what they did really well, now why did we pick them? They were located in an industrial area where there were lots of manufacturing operations, and they manufactured dog food. Uh, the area had an unemployment rate of, of under 2%, which means basically everybody has a job. Uh, whenever they posted a job opening at Iams Pet Food Company, they, they would have, on average, 150 applicants for that job. And they, they had a 6% uh, uh, turnover rate. So why would people come want to come there. Well, it was interesting. It was, it was one, of the, one of the things that we learned about was their, the way they gave raises was for people to learn. They, they didn't give raises for years of experience uh, or all these other factors that we did. It, it was when people showed that they learned and demonstrated the learning, they paid them more. Every worker in that factory operation, and there were multiple different elements to the factory operation. Every worker they hired had to go through and learn every job in the factory operation. And they'd put them in an area for six months. After that six months, they would test them with written tests, and, they, and then they had if, to demonstrate uh, certain skills. If they passed the test, they got a raise. Everybody came in at the same rate, at the same hiring rate. They pass the test, they get a raise. They move to the next unit. They do the same thing. If they didn't pass, they don't get a raise. They have to stay uh, longer. Um, now, the fascinating thing about this is everybody could move through the, to the maximum rate of pay in three and a half years. And if you didn't move there in three and a half years, you were terminated. Everything, all pay was based on them knowing how to do the work in every area of the plant. Fascinating. Uh, process that's so different from what our traditional approaches are, but it really worked for them. Now, I'm going to tell you one more because uh, this one is a little little off of the learning side, but it's uh, it it fits. Uh, is that they? Uh, whoops, went too fast. Uh, the other thing that they did was uh, with satisfaction surveys. They did employee satisfaction surveys, and when they got those satisfaction surveys back, they only did them once every two years. But when they got those surveys back, the results back, they shared them with every employee, and they closed the production down for a day, closed the plant down. 
they put all the employees into small groups. Every small group was led by a trusted member of the management team. They had flip chart paper. They sat there and, 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 and every group, they, each group did this. They went through, here's what our survey results said we did well. Tell us, what is it that we're doing that causes you to respond positively to these questions? They built a list. Here's what we're doing well. They did the same thing. They went to stuff where the survey results weren't as good, and they asked the question, what is it that we need to do differently in order for you to score this area higher in satisfaction? Uh, they built the lists, and then at the end of the day, they brought all the managers together with their lists. They compiled the lists to see what was alike. And amazingly, with all the different groups, usually the stuff came out very similar. So they could readily identify what we're really doing well and what we need to change. Within a week, the CEO sent a letter to every employee and told them, we listen to you. Here's the things you said we need to change. Here's our timeline for making changes for these things. Now, there, and in some cases, they said, you said this about our changes, but this is a change that we don't feel we can make right now. Here's the reasons why. And so they justified why they couldn't make that change. Now, you talk about listening to employees. <laughs> Uh, that's a pretty dynamic result, and we started modeling that in, in our organization as well. I had to modify it some, but because we couldn't close the nursing facility down, but uh, uh, we did uh, come up with some some ways to apply that and uh, what we did. Focus on the supervisor. We talked about training and development. Now, you can go out there and put all these programs together for everybody, but if, if you're starting this, if you're not doing it yet, make sure you're focusing on the supervisor. Gallup studies, extensive research uh, that were first written about in a book. They, HR people love to, the title I know, First Break All the Rules. Don't HR people love a title like that? Uh, Marcus Buckingham wrote this, but the conclusion from the research was is people don't leave their organizations, they leave their immediate supervisor, okay? Um, there's lots of research that shows that dissatisfied and uh, unengaged employees are the ones who complain about pay and benefits. There's lots of studies that keep getting done that say that it's people are leaving for pay. Uh, depending on how those survey questions are asked, uh, gets you different results. But there's nothing that has changed the fact that people who are engaged, who feel empowered, who feel valued, pay is much less of an issue for them. Uh, and, and you tend to keep them. People leave because they don't feel engaged, and that engagement comes by primarily by their immediate supervisor. Uh, here's what we found in our organization, and I've looked at lots of organizations throughout my career, and I find it similar. People tend to get promoted into supervisor positions from being really good and working their job really well, and they never cause any trouble. Uh, those two factors, you get, we got a supervisor job open, uh, we'll put you in it. We then somehow automatically believe that by promoting them to supervisor, they learn supervisor skills by osmosis or some other means. Uh, the truth is, people need to be trained uh, to be effective supervisors. Uh, so I'm going to walk through several modules that uh, uh, I have helped develop. Uh, I, I did these uh, at Better Health Services. Uh, Citizens Memorial Hospital asked me to help them put together supervisor training. Uh, 
several years ago, and uh, we talked about what that needs to be, what are you seeing as the needs. Interestingly, it came back to these same kind of modules. Uh, so let me just kind of tell you what these are. Uh, one of the modules that we focused on was communication styles. Uh, we used the DISC personality profile. Anybody ever seen DISC? Number of you have. So it's a great tool. Uh, the, the employee, you, you provide it to them either online or in a written format. Uh, they walk through and do some things there with that, and it produces a profile around a D driver, I influence, S steadiness, uh, C conscientiousness uh, profile, and, and it helps you. And then it actually describes puts out a description of, of who they are. There's about 13 different descriptions. It's kind of scary, but it seems to work. The main thing about this whole communication style module and the DISC profile is what it does is it teaches a supervisor to, first of all, recognize that I have a style that is different than my employees. Each of them has a style that I have to appreciate. And it's my job to learn how to flex my style to theirs. It's not my job to force them to adapt to mine. And it actually, then we go into here and we teach how to communicate across different styles. And to recognize and appreciate every style is valuable. Every style has the same value and purpose, but we've got to learn to communicate effectively through that and that, that module focused on that. That module alone, when we did it at Vetters, it, it had amazing results uh, with uh, our supervisors were thrilled to know about themselves and to learn about their employees as well and how to be more effective. Uh, the second module uh, that I would recommend that you have something like this is uh, dealing with conflict resolutions. Uh, conflict is always happening. The question is, is how do we deal with it? And most of the time, we tend to ignore it. We keep thinking it'll go away if we just ignore it. Supervisors tend to do that. They don't like to deal with conflict. They don't like to deal with it because they don't know how. So what we do in this module is give them five steps, a five-step uh, conflict resolution methodology. Uh, which they can practice in the session. Uh, but we also deal with uh, uh, how, to, how to deal with difficult people. So we kind of got a list of uh, difficult cate people categories and, and best strategies for dealing with why do people do this and, and what do we do. Now, the focus on this module is to teach employees that are supervisors that every one of their employees really wants to do a good job and have fulfillment from their work. And when they are behaving in a way or not performing or behaving in a way that you feel is inappropriate, there's a reason for that usually. And if you can understand that reason and deal with them on that reason, you may be able to change the behavior permanently, not just by forcing it to change. You may change their motivation to do that. And when you focus on, supervisors learn to focus on uh, that kind of a, a mode of dealing with people, it transforms uh, what people feel, how people feel valued and looked at uh, in the organization and, and the engagement. The other one that we do here is uh, uh, one on performance evaluation. Uh, again, this one gets into, uh, so how do you look at people? Well, when somebody isn't, when there's performance discrepancies, how do you deal with those? Uh, tendency is, well, they're not performing, they must need training. Uh, uh, that's one reason. So we, we actually provide a methodology to walk through and analyze why a performance discrepancy may be occurring and deal with that. And then finally, uh, the list of modules that we focused on for supervisors, and I think these are 
basic core ones is problem solving. Uh, learning to know the difference between when you have a problem and a decision to make and being able to go in and uh, use a rational methodology to solve problems and to make decisions. Uh, when you can get people past uh, just reacting to things or giving it their best shot and you can get them to actually think through how to solve problems and make decisions, they become much better supervisors along the way. Whoops. Okay. So the objective of, of all those modules and training is to uh, enhance the supervisor's ability to coach performance rather than to just simply direct worker activities. And out of that, we hope to see change and improvement along the way. Change occurs and growth and performance occurs when you combine knowledge, new knowledge, people are learning with new processes, which means this is how they're going to utilize that learning along with coaching that holds, that it provides them both encouragement and accountability to follow that process and adopt the learning. When you can combine those three is when you actually get change and performance improvement out of the process. Finally, let me encourage you to offer uh, your workers hope through your training and development programs. Uh, there's some really good research out there on the whole hope issue uh, that, that says that if, when people have clear goals and pathways uh, to achieving something, uh, they have hope. And when people are persistently frustrated by a situation they're in, they tend to lose hope. And when they lose hope, you lose performance, you lose engagement, uh, you typically end up losing the employee. So hope is important. Uh, companies prosper when workers can see a clear path to making things better for themselves and for the organization. Uh, the culture and systems should help them set and achieve personal and work goals. You got to think about both. We at uh, up in Omaha set up a corporate university. How many of you have a corporate university structure? Anybody? Okay. I, it, it it sounds fancy and big. It's not all. We weren't that big. We just we thought we got to have a framework to address learning and development end. So let's create a corporate university. We called it the VHS Quality College. And we issued certificates for learning out of that. We, we, and it was all fairly simple stuff, but it, it, it kind of looked important. And it gave us a clear structure to where we were going with our training and development uh, kind of things. Uh, so uh, you need to develop. So some of those programs can be, how do I uh, just do my work better? Some of those need to be focused on the personal growth side. Uh, interesting studies have shown that uh, there's a huge portion of our population that if they can't figure out how to spend their money correctly, are going to fail, and you're going to lose them in your organizations. So sometimes it's personal finance areas. Sometimes that personal need training deals with parenting skills. Uh, there's lots of areas you can make your workers have a clear pathway to hope by helping them have access to those kinds of learning opportunities that make them better as a person as well as the pathways to learning and training that makes them a better worker in your organization. Uh, hope and engagement are very closely correlated. I've got on this slide the uh, uh, Gallup's uh, 12 survey questions for engagement. Any of you using Gallup's engagement survey? Nobody? Okay. Um, I'm just going to give you a moment to look down through those.
Interestingly, the one on there that has a very high correlation to overall engagement is do I have a best friend at work? So the social aspect of your organization has an important role. Uh, and, and, and enabling people rather through your learning and development programs and, and developing within your, your work structures opportunities for that socialization to occur uh, has some real value to it as well. I challenge you this, just looking at this list, if you were to use this list to set up an assessment of all of your HR activities, uh, what would you focus on? Where would you go? Uh, to me, it's a, it's a, it can be used as a guideline for developing the whole HR area. Questions? No, no. It's, it's a best friend. It's somebody that in the organization you trust and relate well to. Yeah. <laughs> Team building, relationship building, yes. Uh, at, at our organization, Omaha, we, we had conferences uh, uh, for our different groups, and we always engaged in lots of different kind of team building things. We put them in teams. Uh, the ones I liked the best is where we would put them in groups. Some point we had teams of 10, 15, and we created these challenges for the teams. And those challenges sometimes engaged in physical uh, aspects uh, in learning and testing aspects and we usually had three or four different elements that collectively they had to achieve and when they did that it was a tremendous uh, learning and engagement of them to, to work with each other. There's some great stuff out there online. Just uh, There's one about paper holding together. There's one where you're teaching people to, to toss something or to fly a paper airplane over a line, but that isn't really what you wanted. I use a tennis ball teaching uh, program where I put people in groups and circles and competitive kind of circles and have them toss the ball back and forth. Uh, it's to teach process uh, management and process improvement. Uh, we we give them a ball, we time, we toss, have them toss it across the group, and then to somebody else, tell everybody is both caught and toss the ball. We tell them that the only uh, rule here is that the ball must move from person to person in the same way it did the first time. So we give them five, or not, no, we, we give them about a minute, get together, figure out how you can improve what you just did. A lot of times they'll rearrange themselves so they can pass the ball around the circle instead of toss it across. But then we tell them, hey, you can do better than that. Uh, sometimes, and but the, the rule is, the ball must, the only rule is, the ball must move from person to person the same way it did the first time. Uh, usually we'll end up with one group that everybody puts their hand in the middle and the person that has the ball moves it across the hands. Now, what's the purpose of that? The purpose of that is simply, we get bond, bogged down in process improvement by thinking there's rules that aren't really rules. We're, the ways we've always done something, this is what we do. So finding exercises to teach people to move past that uh, is a better way of learning than me standing up here lecturing to you. I, I know that. So yeah, but there's, there's lots of stuff online that gets you there too. Have a good day.